Thank you very much. It is an honor to be with you this afternoon and to talk about some things that I have cared about for the last 30 years. We have a narrow window of time, and so I'm going to launch deep, hard, and fast. Does that sound good? Here we go. So a few months ago, I talked with Walt Bedinger, who's the CEO of Charles Schwab. And Walt said his number one challenge as a CEO is isolation. It's isolation in the sense that you've got to get information at the top so you can decide where do we go in the future. But because of the fact that you're at the top, you get isolated, where people either tell you what they think you want them, that you want to know, or they don't tell you things that you should know because they're afraid to tell you about the bad news. And so the issue becomes, how does a leader at any level, CEO or below, how do they figure out to get beyond the isolation challenge? Ed Catmull at Pixar put it simply, it's the dangerous disconnect. Those are two powerful words. And both of them are of the opinion that it doesn't matter whether we're a first-line supervisor or a CEO, it's a fundamental challenge of leading and of developing leaders to be capable of avoiding the isolation. Let me give you a couple of examples where the dangerous disconnect had a powerful impact. Real quickly, go back in time just for a moment. Garmin, TomTom, Tom, those little things that are on the dashboards of some cars these days, they were the competitive companies going head to head with each other strategically trying to figure out what's the other one doing, what's the other one doing, and before they knew it, Google, Google Apps comes out, and boom, the terrain just changed. And then, in that same domain of the San Francisco Silicon Valley area, you've got the San Francisco Taxi Cab Company. That if you go back literally five years, I would be stunned if you looked at their management board meeting agenda or their items, if they were spending substantial amounts of time on this little thing called Uber that comes out of nowhere, combined with Lyft, and collectively causes them in January of this year to go bankrupt. The challenge becomes they didn't know what they didn't know. Now you go forward to the present. You've got Uber coll <laughs> collaborating with Volvo. You've got Lyft collaborating with GM. You've got Tesla that's already got more data than anybody around auto, uh, autopilot driverless cars. And they're all trying to figure out the next uh-oh, the next what didn't we didn't we know in order to be ahead of the other folks. And this is something that Elon Musk at Tesla does today, but he did it when he was really young. When he was in third or fourth grade, Elon read the Encyclopedia Britannica from front to back. That's 30,000 plus pages. And his reflection on it was, wow, I didn't realize what I didn't know I didn't know. And then he said, there is so much out there. And that kind of attitude, that sort of an approach, is fundamental to being able to get beyond what I'm calling the leader's dilemma, which is there are things we know we know, and there are things that we know we don't know. But the real blind spots, the real blind sides, the real trouble comes from what we don't know we don't know. And what Elon did by reading the entire Encyclopedia Britannica to see what was out there that he was completely unaware of was critical for him to see things other people couldn't see. This is a CEO's dilemma. This is Bill McDermott, CEO of SAP. He gets it, isolation and the dilemma. It's the founders and CEO's dilemma. Sarah Blakely at Spank, same sort of issue. You've got even here in Massachusetts, the governor's dilemma. Deval Patrick was the recent governor. He's not currently, but had the chance to visit with him. It's not just a business issue. It's a political issue as well. How do you get beyond the isolation of a position of leadership? These happen to be high-level leaders. But all of them said, without exception, this challenge of isolation and figuring out we don't know we don't know is just not senior leader's challenge. It's any leader's challenge. But at the senior level, it's like the vice grip tightens and makes it more and more impossible to figure out what we don't know we don't know. So the challenge then becomes, and you kind of get it, I think you get it, but the issue becomes, what do we do as leaders 
And what do we do as developer, developers of other leaders to prepare them to figure out what they don't know they don't know before it's too late? Coaching is a classic example. Great coaches in a developmental setting are doing precisely that. They're creating an environment where the windows open up in someone's head and heart to the point that they see something they never saw before, in themselves primarily, and decide to do something about it. Boom, they didn't know what they didn't know, and then opportunity opens up. So how do we help people do this? My answer to that question is data-driven. So I go out and I'm trying to figure out by talking to people what's the answer to it. So over the last four to five years, I've interviewed about 200 plus leaders who are very good at figuring out what they don't know they don't know before it's too late, the unknown unknowns. And these folks that we've talked with, that I've had the chance to visit with, Mark Benioff at Salesforce.com, Elon Musk at Tesla, You've got people like Maureen Chiquet, who for a decade was the CEO of Chanel, Daniel Lamar, who's the CEO of Cirque du Soleil, way over in the other part of the world, a guy named Fadi Gondor, who's one of the most successful innovators in the Middle East, founded a company called Aramex. The issue is the following. These are leaders of some of the most innovative companies in the world. And they're sustainable in their innovation. They're not just overnight situations. They do it year after year. And what's really interesting is the leaders at the top in these sorts of organizations behave in ways that leaders at non-innovative companies just don't get it. So let me share with you a little bit of what they do. Number one, they unlock the dilemma of these unknown unknowns, this big blind spot of what they don't know they don't know by asking the right questions, because every dilemma has a question that unlocks it. I don't have my keys in my pockets to my car right now or to my home, but it's like a key. A question unlocks that box of what we don't know we don't know before it's too late. Peter Drucker once said that there's nothing more dangerous or useless than the right answer to the wrong question. The reason the dilemma exists for leaders is because they are asking the wrong questions. Again, I think I know what's going on in some of your heads, which is, OK, I get that. We need to ask the right questions. But the tougher thing becomes, how do you do that? <laughs> it's easy to say it, but it's like, how would you teach someone else to do that? So what I discovered is the starting point was a guy named Michael Sippy. He used to be the vice president of product development at Twitter. Now he's the CEO of Talk Show Industries. And I was visiting with Michael at Twitter's headquarters in San Francisco on the top of their headquarters area, beautiful sunny day. And we were talking about how, Michael, do you figure out the right questions to take your company, your team, your organization to a better, different place? And he said a very simple thing. How do you put yourself in a situation where you can ask the right questions? There are conditions that cause us to ask better questions. And from his mindset, I've got to put myself in those conditions. And then the issue becomes, well, what are those conditions? And here's what I learned. Number one, these leaders get up, get out, and seek out very surprising situations. You do not find them in their offices. Elon Musk right now is trying to figure out a revolutionary manufacturing model because they've got to produce so many cars so fast and they've never done it before. He's living in the factory in Fremont, literally with a sleeping bag at times, trying to figure this thing out. Get up, get out, surprising situations. Be with strikingly different people and strikingly different places from your normal routine. And these leaders do that routinely. And when they do, here's what happens. They're a little more wrong, a little more uncomfortable, and a little more quiet than they normally are. Think of your competencies in your organization about leadership. You know, how many of you have, they need to be wrong, <laughs> or be un maybe, maybe uncomfortable, maybe quiet. But put them together, it's an odd combination. A.G. Lafley, who two times was the CEO of Procter & Gamble, and during at least one of those 10 years, was a profound driver of innovation that changed the whole company in a powerful, positive way. He said at the end of all that, running a 100,000-plus person company, 
that's over 100 years old, he said, keep it Sesame Street simple. Lou Gerstner, you know, big, massive transformation in selling mainframes of solutions earlier on at IBM. He said the reason, part of the reason why he quit the job was he just had to say the same thing over and over again, solutions, solutions, solutions. He got tired of saying the same thing over and over again. Part of senior leadership is having a message on cue where you're right, you're confident, you're comfortable, and you're vocal about it. But if that's all the leader does, they're going to walk straight into the dilemma. And they're going to get blindsided. And so what's fascinating about AG is he compliments that keep it Sesame Street simple with something he asks himself every Monday morning when he wakes up, which is, what am I going to be curious about this week? It's a fascinating question. What am I going to be curious about this week? And then he goes out and he does something about it. Everywhere he travels, every country he went to, he would be in supermarkets, he would be in consumers' homes, and he would be trying to watch and see and figure out what is happening here. Are we delighting the customers when they buy? Are we delighting when they purchase and when they use it? Now, what he also bumps into when he's out there in the world answering his curiosity question is there's a high probability he's going to be wrong, not right. And that's the point. So that's the next step. Get out there, be wrong. One of the leaders we talked to was a guy named Stuart Brand. Anybody heard of Stuart Brand? A little bit older now, but he did this thing called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was like the internet before the internet, and he's been deeply involved in Silicon Valley. He's an innovation icon there amongst the people who do that work there. I asked him, how do you figure out what you don't know you don't know? He sent back this haiku-like, email. He said, every day I wake up wondering how many things I'm dead wrong about. That's not what most leaders wake up thinking. And I shared this <clears throat> in Platstam, Germany a, a couple of years ago with Hasso Plattner, the CEO of um, SAP. Not CEO, he was the CEO, but he's one of the co-founders of SAP. When I said that, you know, every day I wake up in the morning wondering how many things I'm dead wrong about, Hustle Plattner immediately like raised his hand. He said, that's me. <laughs> I do the same thing. It's what these folks do when they're going out into the world. I know with reasonable confidence, very few of you probably have heard of this guy, Joe Matiath. <sighs> Founded an organization called Gram Vikas in India. It provides sewage and water treatment for small villages in a sustainable way. And if you know much about that world, most wells that get drilled and most sewage systems that get put in these small villages within a few years, they just get rusty, unused, and fall apart. Joe's systems don't do that. They're very community-involved, community-based. But I'm going to go backwards before we talk just a second about them. Joe was 18. He's relatively well off. His family owns a lot of land, and they farm that land. Actually, he's 16, not 18. We're going to go back a little further in time. Joe's walking home from school one day, and he notices the workers in the field scooping up water that is full of mud to drink. It's the only water they could get. And for whatever reason, it struck Joe, this is wrong. He marched up to the supervisor in the field and said, why are they drinking that muddy, awful water? The supervisor said, they're workers, Joe. It's the best we've got. Get out of here. Joe then goes immediately to his father and just is incensed. He's uncomfortable. He's angry. He's like, what's going on here, Dad? Long conversation, a bit of uncomfortableness in the situation. But at the end of it, they finally got to the point where they decided, we need to get clean water for our workers. Then. He ends up, they do it. A couple of years later, when Joe is 18, he gets on a bike like that one, no money, and like Gandhi, literally rides his bike through every state in India. He's trying to figure out what are the needs of this country and of the people I'm a part of. And that's where he landed on. They need sewage systems and clean water. And so then he came back from that built this organization. You don't put in his systems unless the community is completely supportive and involved with the whole process of putting it in and keeping it going. And now he's got a reasonably large headquarters. And here's what Joe told us. 
Big organization now trying to do a lot of good. Sometimes at headquarters, it gets to the point where things get political. It feels disconnected from the work they're really doing and the customers. And what does Joe do? He gets on the bike, he leaves the headquarters, and he goes back into the field without money, village to village, trying to figure out what's going on to bring it back into the system. He's actively trying to be wrong about the way he sees the world. Now, the second piece becomes when we're out there that way in spectacularly different situations or with different people, not only can we be wrong, but we're more likely to be uncomfortable. One of the people we interviewed was, uh, or not interviewed, but I've heard from Drew Houston, an MIT graduate, he basically said, get out of your comfort zone. It's a mind set. Spend a lot of time thinking about what you don't know you don't know. I'm going to add on to it. It's more than a cerebral mental act. It's like, not just think about it, that's okay, but it's physically get out and do something about it. Anybody heard of ASOS, ASOS? Got a few hands up here. Do you buy things from ASOS? Okay. If this were a group of millennials, about 95% of the hands would go up. So you're on the cutting edge with those crews. Um, it's based out of the UK. It's one of the most innovative companies in the world. Investors pay a premium for the stock because it does so well for the last 15 years. It's online-only clothing. Mostly millennials are buying it. A guy named Nick Baton became the CEO a few years ago. And Nick is a classic UK British man. Used to formal suits and ties, lots of them in his closet. He goes to work the first day at ASOS. What does he realize? He's wearing the wrong stuff in a company for millennials full of millennials. And within two weeks, what he did was he sold on eBay every one of his suits, but two or three that he needed for formal functions every once in a while. And then they looked at what they're doing, and they have a Tuesday morning employee orientation, not a Monday morning employee orientation, because Monday's too boring, Tuesday's better. When they're with those millennials coming into the company, they ask questions of the millennials who are new, and the millennials can ask them questions, the executives, the CEOs. Things like, if you were a movie star, what kind of movie star would you be? They're off the cuff, unexpected, both ways. And what they're learning from the get-go is it's OK for executives to be uncomfortable around people they're working with. And often that happens. And they also have a system built into this online organization where they're constantly driving and getting feedback. Someone might be doing a Google chat, trying to figure out with a customer what's this fitting and what's not. And they might have an idea to make the system better. Or they might realize as they're watching the data and the stuff going on, there's got to be something else we should be doing differently here. And one of the times, one of the data points was people were interested in getting bridesmaid and wedding dresses. This is not a high-end bridal shop. Most of their stuff is really quite inexpensive. But the problem they were trying to solve was most of these millennials would spend thousands of dollars for a wedding dress, and then they would have to sell it because they couldn't afford it in the first place, and they would never have their wedding dress. But the cheap ones weren't pretty. And they came to Nick and said, what do you think? And he's like, I'm a little bit against it. Because even if we could make the wedding dresses, how are we going to ship them in a way that they won't look funny, bad, or ugly when they show up for somebody getting married? They went back to the drawing board. Go online after the meeting. Please don't do it now. <laughs> look up ASOS wedding dresses. They're $200. They're beautiful. And they're the hottest, one of the hottest selling items at ASOS. The shipping problem, they worked it and worked it. And it's a silly solution. The solution was two pizza boxes that fold over in a beautiful white, the ASOS logo. When the dress and the box is handled and delivered to the FedEx or UPS folks, it's in white gloves. It's just their way of saying it's special. But that all came from a situation where Nick himself is OK being uncomfortable and being challenged. He's OK with people taking initiative. And it's one of the funnest sort of things they did at, at ASOS in the last couple of years. Another company, another organization, Cirque du Soleil. Um, obviously, cutting edge. I, you've been at Cirque du Soleil shows. You know their world. You know, amazing stuff that they do. Guy Liberté here, the founder of Cirque du Soleil, 
is very comfortable being wrong, very comfortable being uncomfortable, and he's always out traveling the world trying to get new data and information for new shows, new direction, new ways of doing things. He's done this for years. They even have a program in the system called Open Eyes where everybody's expected and they drop information about art and performers and this and that into the system. And unlike most data gathering insight generation systems, they actually use it. But even at Cirque du Soleil, it's easy to get isolated. It's easy to get comfortable. And one day, Dan, um, Guy de Liberté walked into Danielle Lamar's office, the CEO. And Guy said, Danielle, I've been wandering around in the headquarters, and it feels like it's getting sleepy around here. We're getting a little too comfortable. And, and Danielle's like, OK, Guy, what are we going to do about it? And Guy said, I think we're going to hire a clown for headquarters. So they did. <laughs> Their name's Madame Zazu. And she literally has carte blanche to wander anywhere, at any time, into any meeting, including the board of directors meeting. She has a popcorn machine. She's got her costume on. And she's like a court jester in the Middle Ages, provokes and pokes and makes fun of at any point in any meeting or anything they're doing. It's their attempt to push the system within their own system. Now, I'm not suggesting you hire a clown for your headquarters. <laughs> it works for their culture. But the issue becomes what people, what systems, what practices, what processes do you have in place that enable other people to feel uncomfortable often? At Spanx, Sarah Blakely has a consistent oops meeting where they talk about oops, O-O-P-S, exclamation point. The things they did wrong, the things they knew that was wrong, but they did them wrong. They share and they talk it, they celebrate it, and they make it make a difference. Third and final condition, being more wrong, more uncomfortable, more quiet, is to be more quiet. And part of that quietness is there's a woman named um, Diane Green. She founded VMware early on. Now she's driving and running Google, um, the cloud platform for Google. And Diane said, quiet is the most, being quiet or quiet time is the most important thing to help you look into the future. Obviously, senior people especially are paid to look into the future. But any leader at any level in today's world struggles to find quiet time. Is that fair? She's talking about, she loves to go on boat sailing when she's struggling with an answer, trying to figure something out, a dilemma. And she goes sailing on her own, and she just has quiet time to figure it out. But the quiet I'm talking about is a little different. It's the kind of quiet when you're with Mark Benioff, who's about my height, and he's trying to figure something out. He asks questions, and then he shuts up. Now, Mark's very talkative often, if you know Mark. But he asks questions, he shuts up. And I once asked Mark, how do you figure out the right question to help you unlock what you don't know you don't know? He looked me right in the eye, and he said, listen. And then he was quiet. He was seeing how I listen. And you've talked a bit about this today in some of the sessions, deep listening, really listening, more than your ears kind of listening. And then once he realized I was listening, we had a 20-minute conversation about what does it mean to listen. And what's fascinating is that Mark does this over and over and has for his whole life. It was doing that all over the world that led to the idea, what if we do enterprise-level software like Amazon does books that created Salesforce? It was a week, no, it was a month-long trip this recent year to Japan on a listening spree. That's what they call them. They go on a listening spree. They embed themselves in a system. Mark literally moved over to Japan, in a sense, for three or four weeks and just went all kinds of spectacular different places and people, all kinds of conversations, shut himself up, and gathered tons and tons of data. This guy, Simon McCauley, is the chief marketing officer. He, runs a, he helped the thing called Salesforce Ignite, which Salesforce helps its customers become more innovative through the Ignite program. He does the same thing Mark does. They go on listening sprees to figure out what don't they know, they, what, what, are they, what they don't know they don't know, and they've got to find it out. That's what they do. They go on listening sprees. Ah, so there you go. That's how it works. Being wrong, being uncomfortable, being quiet. How many have all three of those things in your leadership competencies? 
I'm going to suggest you rethink it. Um, now, here's a diagnostic quiz for you alone. You can even write down your answers if you choose to, but we're going to just go through them quickly. I'm going to read them. Here's the first question. How many barriers do you have, do people have to cross to talk with you? The World Economic Forum Davos meetings, where these world leaders meet from companies and governments and so on, it's fascinating to see. Some of those world leaders have 20 people around them. Others, like Mark Benioff, zero. No barrier of entry. It's like, you need to connect, connect. And these sorts of leaders have zero barriers to entry. You want to email Mark within Salesforce.com, you email him. They even have a chatter group in Salesforce.com called Grievances. I was looking at it a few weeks ago when I was out there. It's raw. It's unadulterated. It is the real stuff. There are questions and problems and concerns that are just out there for everybody. That's no layers, no barriers. And Mark sees it, and he, and he wants it there. How many spectacularly different people do you meet each week? How many spectacularly different places do you go each week? And if you can't remember when the last time you did one of those things, I would rethink it. Because you're probably getting set up for a blind side. When was the last time you were dead wrong about something? When was the last time you said, I don't know, when someone asked you a question? And again, some leaders can't remember when the last time was. I think it should be often, frankly, and that's how these leaders respond to it. How often do people ask you uncomfortable questions? If you haven't had an uncomfortable question during the last seven days, guess what? People still ask them. <laughs> they either talk to their coworkers without you hearing them and ask the question there, or they ask it externally. And either way, it's problematic. So again, an indicator around this. Final question, how many seconds do you wait for others to answer your questions? I just waited four seconds. I counted. Most leaders in educational settings when kids are growing up and in corporate settings, one leader called it the Jack Welch rat-a-tat-tat questioning method. Boom, 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 boom. Most leaders give one second response time. And they're not comfortable with waiting because they're not asking questions that deserve the thoughtful response. So critical questions. Um, these leaders, all I can say is that's what they do. It is part of their everyday routine. It's habitual. I'm going to go back for a moment to um, Walt Bettinger and Charles Schwab. He's constantly putting himself in wrong, uncomfortable, quiet situations so that he can figure this dilemma out. He's systematic about some things. One of those things is he checks multiple vantage points, employees, direct reports, colleagues, peers, owners, shareholders. He's going to them often. And he asks them a question that's really critical. If you were in my job, what would you be focusing on? And he does that often at the end of an analyst call because they need to know that he knows what he's talking about. He's got credibility with them. He knows the ins and outs of Charles Schwab. But then at the end of it, he's honestly asking them, what would you do? Another thing that he does systematically is he recruits others in the quest to figure out the dilemma. And he asks them, my biggest personal challenge is isolation. I admit it. Can you help me? Here's my email. Send me stuff. He responds in nanoseconds. And he really does. Another way he approaches it, he requires brutal honesty. That sounds like, ouch. But when he was early on, his boss did it to him, and he now does it to others. He calls them brutally honest reports. There are five areas in them. One of them is what's broken. It's kind of like the delta change sort of feedback from the prior presentation. This is twice a month from all of his direct reports, month after month after month, and it's cascaded down through the system where it's just the expectation. It's how we do things around here. And that's part of what helps him and his organization ask the questions, unlock what they don't know before it's too late, and make a difference. 
I'm going to share something about Walt that I think is an important story that goes back to his beginnings and why he does what he does. It's the Dottie story, and you don't know who Dottie is, perhaps, but I'm, he told, it's been in the New York Times, and he told me also about it with a little more detail, but he's in college. He's a senior. He comes from a modest family background, and he's very ambitious. And he gets straight A's, and it's his last semester of his senior college. Final class, it's a finance class, I believe. Final exam, he's got straight A's. He's got to get an A in this one to do straight A's through the whole thing. The students come into the classroom, they sit down, there's a single piece of paper, one piece of paper sitting on the desk. And they're like, what's going on here? This makes no sense. And they all sit down, the teacher comes in, and he said, I've taught you everything I possibly can about finance, whatever the topic was. I assume you know it. But as you go forward in your career, there's something you're going to need to figure out that's more important than your knowledge of this subject. And then he asked them a single question. He said, if you have the answer to this one question, you'll pass the exam. If you don't, you'll fail. There was the question. What is the name of the woman who cleans this building? The woman who cleans the building, what's her name? Walt didn't know. He failed. He failed the exam, got a B. The next day, he went to the building and met Dottie. It changed the nature of how he leads and le has led and leads today. He, like other leaders, um, some of whom I've talked about, they pay attention to the invisibles because the people on the edge are the ones who give us the most important information, the stuff that really matters. It's made all the difference for Walt. And I was in an event where Walt was speaking and he was part of the group. It was a Schwab event, 300 people. He went out of his way to make sure he met everybody. It's just the kind of person he is. He was laying the foundation, building the trust, so that when he asked for a brutally honest report, people can trust he's not going to be brutal with them. And it makes all the difference. We're going to jump to um, the make a difference slide, if you wouldn't mind. Can you skip to the make a difference slide, please? Maybe they're listening, maybe they're not. We'll see. Doesn't matter. Um, it's a slide that says make a difference. Um, and I'm going to just summarize with a couple of things. Think of your own situation, think of your own schedule, think of how you do things, and reconsider if you need to. How could I go out and actually be a little more wrong, a little more uncomfortable? and a little more quiet. Duval Patrick, um, the former governor of Massachusetts, called it the power of the pause. Because when we're trying to figure out that big blind spot, um, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work to make a difference. Now, I'm going to show a picture that is a bit personal, and I'm going to end on that kind of note. This is uh, my daughter, our daughter on the right. You're right, yes son-in-law on the left, and the little guy in the middle is Henry. Um, Henry's seven months old. And a few months ago, doctors diagnosed something that was normal, systematic, simple. They were going to do a procedure. All was going to be taken care of. They got a second opinion, perspective from a different doctor. The doctor asked different questions. And because of that, discovered two tumors at the base of Henry's spine. Now, what they found, they thought would be mal not malignant. And they ended up removing them and then discovering they were malignant. And then the probabilities were just absolutely not going to happen, that, that, we, that, that the cancer was there, but it was. But then 
it wasn't supposed to be beyond that, but it was. It was in the blood and the system. So a week ago, he started chemotherapy. And today, he was over with an infection at Boston Children's with Dana-Farber. I share this personal thing for a very simple but important reason. I am very, very grateful for a leader in any setting who pays the price over a course of a career to figure out the things they don't know they don't know. They understand stuff. They see things other people don't see. Of all the places in the world for this very specific, unique thing, the world specialist happens to be at Dana-Farber in a Boston Children's right here. And I can tell in interacting with them, I don't have their names and I can't put their pictures up in front of you, but guess what? I think without exception, every one of them behave exactly how I've just shared with you these other leaders behave. It's an investment. It's looking to the future. It's not easy and it's rarely rewarded. But when leaders do it, it does make all the difference. So I wish you the best as you go forward in your critical leadership development work and know that and hope that you can do the same. Thank you.